Starship parts arriving. Potential landing sites for Starship revealed, ASA satellite near miss with Starlink and four more Starlink launches this year. My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It. We hit 10,000 subscribers. Can you believe it? It's been what, 13 weeks now? And I couldn't be more thankful for all the support I'm getting from the patrons, the viewers and last but not least all my sources. Without you, my work would be much harder. So here's to a great space community and lots more exciting episodes in the future. I've been working on a small project with my team in the background for a while now. Much requested in the comments and asked for all the time, I am proud to present to you the What About It merch store. I've partnered with Teespring, one of the biggest providers of fast produced and high quality merchandise. All the designs you find in there are original What About It work either by me or others on the team. So all the stuff in there is original and you'll find it only there. There are many more designs planned but we'll start slow to get some feedback and to get used to the whole organization side in the back. You can reach it via this link, which I will also put in the description. As soon as possible, there will also be a direct integration into the channel. So you can just click the swag under the episodes here on YouTube. And for everyone loving those flat earthers, I have a very special design in the store. Please attend flat earth conferences in droves. There will be a live stream celebrating the 10k subscribers with you and there will also be a special edition shirt and a rebate code for the whole store for all the hardcore fans to show up for the live stream. I will talk about what it's like to be the host of a YouTube channel, what I've learned in the past few months and what's going on in the background that you might not know and there will of course be some Q&A about space and SpaceX. So make sure to tune in. I am very much looking forward to chatting and having fun with you. Now that we got that out of the way, there have been many things going on in the space industry lately, so let's dive right in. Starship updates. We're getting closer to a working Starship prototype. There has been a huge delivery of internal parts for the orbital prototype in Boca Chica. Trucks packed with crates moved into the construction site and carefully delivered a precious load of all sorts of internal parts. If SpaceX really wants to do the first 20 km hop in October, they'll desperately need these parts now. La Padre did a wonderful flight over the test site again and the results are remarkable. There's only so much that you can see from outside the fence. The bird's eye view though reveals all the little details. Fins have been spotted and we can clearly see now why Elon said that the tin tin look is gone. These look more squared, less wide and to be honest I like it. Aesthetics are not important on a rocket but if it looks cool even better. So that's what Starship will land on. Also the fins will be actuated as stated last year. Here you can see the actuator for the movement. My guess is that it will be mounted with the thick round side towards the Starship and use the actuator to move the fin. Discuss in the comments please, I love to hear your thoughts. Also revealed was a massive bulkhead inside the container fort also dubbed the castle. This no doubt is the top bulkhead which will finish off the bulkhead structure inside the orbital prototype. So we have tanks for methane and oxygen. What's missing now are the header tanks, which will be inside the methane tanks on the bottom of the tank section. As seen in last year's presentation, Starship will feature two rather large header tanks in the tank structure. But what about it? What is a header tank for and why does SpaceX use them? In last year's Starship presentation, Elon revealed some very interesting schematics of the inside structure of the finished Starship. Starship will feature a pretty clever layout when it comes to the different tanks. On top, SpaceX will install the liquid oxygen tank. Below that, they will have the liquid methane tank and inside of that tank, they will put the header tanks. These tanks are for storing the propellant needed for landing the Starship. As it will fly through space on trips to Mars and Moon for longer periods of time, these tanks are to keep the propellant insulated to prevent excessive boil off. Also, smaller tanks prevent sloshing and thus have less problems with feedline starvation while in powered flight. As the Starship tanks will be very big, this is a very clever way of preventing these problems from happening. We also got a look at three new assembly pads and last episode we saw the drilling and piling work in preparation. So expect it to be big as the drilling went down to 30 meters or 100 feet. This leads me to the conclusion that Super Heavy might be built in three stacks, possibly to prevent structural damage while stacking the rings as it happened on the orbital prototype. So that's it for Boca Chica, but we're not done yet with Starship. We'll just move a bit up the timeline. SpaceX actively searching for landing sites on Mars. 
As most of us will already know, in the end, starships are supposed to get the first humans to Mars. Even more, they are supposed to help build the first settlements on Mars. So we know the truck Elon is going to use, but what's been keeping me busy for a while now is where exactly he's going to build that Mars base Alpha. Mars only has about half the diameter of Earth. Its average surface temperature is minus 63 degrees Celsius or about minus 81 Fahrenheit. It has a very low atmospheric pressure of about 0.6% of that of Earth's atmosphere and the scientific consensus is that in most parts of Mars there is no or very little water. So how do you get these parameters to the best possible level? We're looking for a place that is relatively warm, has the highest possible air pressure and lots of water. So you're looking for a place close to the equator, as low in altitude as possible and with some form of water close by that at best is flat so you can land and build easy. SpaceX has secretly been looking for such a spot for a while now. With the help of NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and its high-rise camera, they seem to have found six possible spots and are assessing them right now. This is a height elevation map of Mars. This by the way is almost two thirds of the northern hemisphere in view just to give you a scale. Now let's zoom in a bit into the area west of Olympus Mons, the highest mountain in our solar system. It rises 26.4 kilometers up into the Martian sky. And let's get some reference points in to see where exactly we are. Olympus Mons is located close to an area known as Amazonis Planitia, which is just south of Arcadia Planitia. And right on the border of these two large lowland plains, SpaceX is analyzing pictures of the possible landing sites and future locations for Mars Base Alpha. If all goes well, these are the six spots where the first human settlements on Mars could be built. All of these locations have these before mentioned aspects in common. They are very low in altitude, close to the equator where you have lots of solar energy available and a high temperature and maybe most importantly, they are expected to have massive underground glaciers full of water ice which is needed to produce propellant for starships and for supply of water for later to arrive colonists. The evidence that SpaceX is looking for locations near buried glaciers is further reinforced by the fact that all the locations above Above are inside the northern 30 to 60 degree latitude band where Martian glaciers are thought to exist in abundance, either as lobate aprons or crater glaciers. Lobate debris aprons are a geological feature on Mars. First seen by the Viking orbiters, these consist of piles of rock debris below cliffs. These features have a curved topography and a gentle slope from cliffs, which suggests flow away from the steep source cliff. They show all the features a rock glacier on Earth would show. Scientists strongly believe that they in fact are buried glaciers holding enormous amounts of water ice. This shows that SpaceX might be far ahead of what we think today. They are not only working full steam ahead on the orbital prototype, they are also actively trying to answer questions to where to build the first human settlement on Mars. You know, I always wondered why Elon founded the Boring Company and there might definitely be use for that on Mars when building habitats and mining. Starlink near miss with ASA satellite. On September 2nd, Holger Krag, head of the Space Debris Office at ASA, gave out an official press release. It was about a collision avoidance maneuver performed by ASA on one of their Aeolus Earth observation satellites to avoid a collision with SpaceX's Starlink Satellite 44. And ASA Operations posted a tweet series about how it had to avoid collision with one of SpaceX's satellites. First, the calculated risk was at 1 to 50,000 for the collision. Then, ASA experts calculated there was a 1 in 1,000 chance of a collision between the two satellites. It was more than enough to justify the move. So far, so good. This is something that happens rather often in space. Since there is no law regulating a satellite's position in space, satellite providers have to either stay away from each other or do these kinds of maneuvers to sometimes alter course to avoid accidents. Then though there was the rather strange official statement by Holger Krag from ESA. He stated that they informed SpaceX who replied and said that they do not plan to take action. ESA released a long line of tweets saying that it is very rare to perform collision avoidance maneuvers with active satellites and that the vast majority of ESA avoidance maneuvers are the result of dead satellites or fragments from previous collisions. Yesterday then SpaceX cleared up the situation by releasing a statement. 
Apparently there was a bug in their communication software preventing them from getting further emails from ESA. When ESA released the first email that SpaceX responded to, chances were 1 in 50,000. So SpaceX replied that they would not move the Starlink satellite. Later, emails then were not received and led to ESA believing that SpaceX outright refused to move the satellite. But what about it? Why didn't the communication work between the two satellite operators? Satellite collisions can cause very serious problems. Not only does it result in the loss of very expensive hardware, it also produces huge amounts of debris, raising the risk of further collisions with the resulting debris. In theory, this could cause a cascade, resulting in a disaster-like situation in orbit. So how do satellite operators communicate potential problems between each other? By email. There is no automated system in place to give out a warning. There are no warning signals or sirens or whatever you might imagine to be adequate warnings. It's emails. This is due to the fact that there are not that many satellites out there. This will radically change in the near future though, as SpaceX, Amazon and others are planning to send up huge satellite constellations with thousands of satellites each to beam internet services back to Earth. Klaus Merz of ESA's Space Debris Office said that emails can't be the future in this case. An automated and interconnected warning system should be implemented in the near future to avoid these kinds of miscommunications. SpaceX is planning to do four more Starlink launches in 2019. This news fits perfectly onto the last one. On August 30, SpaceX filed for eight FCC Special Temporary Authority licenses. Additionally, SpaceX filed for the FCC permits required for the launch and drone ship recovery of Falcon 9 rockets for the next four Starlink missions. NET stands for no earlier than. Typically, a launch occurs within four weeks of these dates. Cape Canaveral Air Force Station and Kennedy Space Center are planning dates for SpaceX's next two Starlink missions, confirming that the company is planning for launches roughly one week after the dates on its newly requested FCC STAs. These official planning dates show two Starlink launches no earlier than October 17th and November 4th. If all these launches take place in 2019, Starlink will grow by another 240 satellites by the end of the year. Maths is definitely right, emails won't do the trick anymore. So this wraps up today's episode of What About It? Where on Mars would you land and will Starlink satellites cause problems in LEO? As always, tell me in the comments. Welcome to the Patron Shoutout, where I thank all those who help What About It to become better each episode. And as in every single episode, we have a few new supporters. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Jonathan Gaskin, Glenn Lambert, Doris Dory, and Jeff Stagg. Thank you very much for your support and do not forget to join us on our patron exclusive Discord. Thank you for watching this episode of What About It? If you liked what you saw, please don't forget to subscribe and like, as this helps me the most. Feel free to hit me up on my Patreon page so I can get additional help in doing more and better content as this gives me more time to focus on what I really love doing, to give you the latest and greatest about space and science. I hope to see you on the next episode. Until then, have a great time. And do not forget to join us on our Discord exclusive patron. What? No! Thank you very much for your support and do not forget us. <laughs> do not forget us. <laughs> Without you, my life would suck. <laughs> Holger Krag from space. Who comes up with these names? <laughs>